October 30th is Create a Great Funeral Day, asked my husband Mark, reading from my phone. <laughs> Does that have anything to do with Dia de los Muertos? Yes. Nope, it says here it was created in 1999 by a California lawyer named Stephanie West Allen. She wanted to create a national holiday to smash the taboo around planning for death. He's looking at his own phone now, searching. You know what else October 30th is? I raise an eyebrow and wait for his big reveal. National Candy Corn Day. <laughs> we should plan our funerals, I clap, while eating candy corn. Do we have candy corn? No, that, that shit's nasty. I guess we just have to plan our funerals then. Lying in bed, late at night, not sleeping. Thinking about my death and eventual funeral, I decided to check in with myself about what I want. The good-natured half of me thinks I'd rather have a celebration of life style funeral. Nope, cynical Mary Bats. I want those motherfuckers to cry. There will be weeping, damn it. But wouldn't you like those to be happy, nostalgic kind of tears, I ask myself. No, if I have to be dead, people should suffer. Our loss should be profound. Yeah. Cynical me is, um, is kind of an asshole, I admit. But she's not totally wrong. Trying to come up with a fun-loving funeral seems like a really indulgent task, one that is designed to emotionally manipulate. You'd be walking a razor-thin edge to get that balance right and then counting on others, people who may have their own motives, to pull it off. I've worked in theater for years, and the only way I can see that working out is if I hire a really good director before I die. <laughs> and a lighting designer. And scenic, and I'm not exactly religious, so maybe it should be in a theater. Shit, I can't afford this production. <laughs> the most meaningful funerals I've been to, though, have been personal. One for an amazing local actress involved everyone gathering at a theater she often performed in while drinking shots of Jack and eating Big Macs in her honor, her opening night ritual food. When my grandfather's husband died, I'm sorry, when my husband's grandfather died, we gathered on a piece of property he loved in a tiny town called Rough and Ready. We told stor stories, we circled up. We let his ashes wash away in Squirrel Creek, each of us murmuring private words as we released our portion of his remains. And when my aunt died, and I sat through the standard numbing Catholic funeral. I felt nothing until the end when my focus on the incense swirling around the small box containing her ashes was pulled away by the sudden introduction of the upbeat, swelling music of De Colores. <laughs> the congregation stood as one, a rush of emotion and noise pushing my body upward with the crowd as the song filled the church and an odd sensation like confusion filled my mind. <laughs> That's when I finally fell apart in that cacophony a wail escaping my throat, the noise masked in the stomping, hand-clapping song, my knees buckling as my daughter and a dear friend carried my body downward back into the pew, where I wept and shouted at the indignity of her loss, till the absence of her presence fill me up and empty me out. None of these transformative moments have been the same. There's no formula here but honesty. The next morning, I seize on the bigger question, the one that nobody wants to ask. Hey, I say to my husband across the dining room table, so we made these kids together? What happens to them if we die together? My husband blinks at me, pondering my question. Um, somebody else deals with them because we are dead. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's kidding, but part of me wants to go with that as the plan. <laughs> We're supposed to be responsible adults now that we have made these tiny humans, and this, this won't fly. We need to make a plan, I insist. Mark nods, and we promise to think about it. Instead, we are knee-deep in parenting little girls, cooking and cleaning and negotiating with toddlers about diapers or where to sleep at night. By the time they're settled in bed, we're strung out on the couch, clutching a mason jar of wine possessively, eyes wide, glancing over to each other periodically to say, no, right? <laughs> Parenting like this is intense and often feels like damage control. We are tired and seldom have any brain power left by the end of the night. And the question is so big. Years go by. We fo focus on building a garden, letting the kids plant wobbly roads of produce and bright flowers. We get a flock of chickens and hatch out chicks of our own 
the girls naming the small fuzzy creatures and loving on them until they grow too big to be interesting anymore. <laughs> we get ourselves a couple of goats, and I learn to milk them, frothing their intensely rich cream into a latte each morning, or making homemade granola to swim in all that richness. We even learn to snap the neck of an aggressive rooster, pluck it and clean it, and cook it into amazing shredded meat spiced oh, for tacos. Oh, <laughs> Someone from work, her husband gets diagnosed and dies a mere six months later, leaving her with two young children and a heartbreak so deep she can barely breathe. They didn't have life insurance and instead have to crowdfund funeral expenses and support. In the wake of this unsettling death, we decide to, to buy life insurance, but still we neglect making a will. We are terrible parents. If we don't make a plan for them, I flail my arms, a dense feeling of hopelessness, hopelessness taking over. We are, he concedes. <laughs> but if we both die at once, they'll have a bunch of money from the life insurance. <laughs> okay, but we have to decide who manages that money and who makes sure they take a shower once in a while. Okay, Mark agrees. Let's talk options. We settle on their uncle, Steve. <laughs> Older than my husband by six years, he took care of Mark when they were young, and life was an ever-changing melee of new cities and towns. They lived in 12 different places by the time Mark was 12 years old, and often they'd have no more notice than, kids, pack your things, we're moving in the morning. For a while, they lived in a school bus, the furniture strapped to the walls, the world constantly shifting under their feet. Steve was always there to shepherd his young brother through these transitions and protected my husband from their difficult, difficult, often dangerous stepfather. Steve is a teacher and kid free, but always wanted kids of his own. We knew he would swoop in and comfort his nieces, taking care to build a world for them in orphanhood. When we visit him in Northern California, he serenades our daughters with his guitar and sweet voice, singing folk, con folk tunes as they settle into the spare bedroom he's prepared for them. He tends a large garden, growing his own food like we do. His home is on five acres of rolling hills, bordering a creek flush with blackberry bushes. He has his own artesian well, fresh, clean water bubbling up at the end of the lane. He makes regular trips to the river, spending days there with us, our kids flopping like fish in the water, signing themselves on the hot boulders, while Uncle Steve teaches them about the riot of nature all around them. Back at his house, we pick through the brambly blackberries to collect the fruit, our feet in the cool stream rolling lazily below. I fold organic ingredients from his kitchen into a pie we eat with ice cream. Later that night, while Mark and I lay on the hood of the car watching a meteor shower above in the deeply dark sky and listening to the soft bubbling comfort of the stream nearby, my eyes well up at the thought that lands solidly in my belly. This is it, I say to him in the slivered moonlight. This is where they should be raised if we die. I feel his head nod next to me as he folds me up in his arms and kisses me sweetly. Aww. When we get home from that visit, we talk more about actually writing our will, but we don't rush. So assured are we by our decision that the urgency melts away. We haven't even yet brought it up to him when Uncle Steve gets a diagnosis of his own and things change dramatically. He sells the house with the epic garden, the well, the lazy stream, the blackberries. He has to quit teaching due to his disability. Now what? I asked my mom. He was the perfect solution to this damn question. She laughs roughly and catches my attention. Stop trying to figure out the perfect solution. If you die, especially together, there will be no perfect anything for your children, at least not any time soon, someday short. But no matter how would you plan it, it can't be perfect. Later, I relay her hard but honest words to my husband, and he sighs heavily. Maybe we should just go back to planning our funerals, Mark suggests. That somehow seems a lot easier right now. We really are terrible parents. If we can't figure this out, I fret. Taking my hands, he replies, yeah, but at least we're failing together. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares for our children if we go before they are grown? Feels like the biggest question I have ever touched. We often say that while we endeavor to be good parents, we won't have any idea how we're screwing up our kids until they are adults. 
The thing we think of as no big deal may be the hurt that they're telling a the therapist about when they're older. The area where we work so hard to shield them may be completely overlooked. We cannot know who we are to them unless they tell us. Hopefully we'll be on message, but who knows. <laughs> Our daughters are 11 and 13 now, and we're not sure what will happen to them if we die. Their uncle is still around, but still not healthy. We cannot ask him to tend to the teens they're about to become. But all this work we put into loving them, being honest with them, teaching them, it tells me I don't need to worry about our funerals at all. These girls we made, they can design one hell of a funeral <laughs> if only the adults around them let them have control. They know us better than anyone else. They are a living reflection of our values, our beliefs, our morals. They are the greatest sum of our two parts. They are strong and wild and can tell endless stories of our family shenanigans. My kids will probably go live with their grandmother if we can't get them all the way to 18, though we haven't asked her yet. She'll embarrass them better than we ever could. <laughs> And she has an epic garden of her own, one my children can dig their hands into when they need a reminder of who I was. Over there, where I secretly ate all the sugar nap snap peas each day, so my mom thought the plant wasn't thriving and pulled it out of the ground. <laughs> Under that tree, where I ate fresh oranges on my back in the sun, and on that low wall, where I made mud pies when I was small, and in that bedroom, with the corner window that looks out on the street and has a closet perfect for hiding in when you feel too big for full-size rooms. It won't be perfect. Nothing will be. They were made for us and us for them. But if we have to leave the children we made together, my mother's house by the beach, the dirt under their nails, the memories we've tattooed on their hearts, all of that will have to be enough.